Good morning, everybody. Really glad to be here. Uh, I would like to start by thanking, obviously, the organizers. Uh, Peter with B2B, I would like to thank Engas, Selwyn, for making it possible for me to be here. And, and a spe special word of thanks to, to Tim. Um, I think, uh, I mean, from what I've seen from the past couple months in, in contact with you, the, uh, you're up against the wall in here. So, uh, I mean, you keep hitting it gently, it will turn into a door. Uh, I think your energy, your dedication, your courage, your conviction, and your passion is second to none. And I think you're driving the industry in, in the right, uh, you're moving the needle in the right direction. So really thank you for what you do. Uh, I wish I had a team in every country I, uh, we operate, but uh, it's not the case. So let me introduce to you the uh, Consumer Good Forum. This is a parity-based organization, uh, 400 members, retailers and manufacturers. So we bring them together. Sounds easy, but it's not, because uh, sometimes they have um, different aspirations, different agendas. Uh, so we, we created the Consumer Goods Forum uh, in 2009, before it was called the CIS. Uh, and then that's what we do, bring retailers and manufacturers from across the globe together to discuss issues that are relevant for the industry. Before I go into the detail, I think what the CGF has accomplished is to identify the relevant issues for the industry, which are the four pillars, set up the right targets, create the right partnerships and the right governance to operate this. So uh, in terms of governance, there is a board composed of 25 retailers and 25 manufacturers represented by the CEOs of these companies. And they meet twice a year, and those are the ones deciding what are the real issues for the industry, refrigeration being one of them. And then there's different steering committees, et cetera, et cetera. So the four pillars uh, are those you have in there. I'm responsible for sustainability. That encompasses environmental and social. There's one on product safety, uh, global food safety initiative, which basically looks into HACCP um, uh, plans. And we just signed an agreement with the government of China to look into HACCP for, for the factories in there. There's a health and wellness pillar. It's a quite interesting one. We look at into product formulation, advertising to children, uh, the whole issue with um, sugar now on, um, on um, different countries with a sugar tax. And then we have an end-to-end -end value chain that looks mainly into uh, issues across the value chain like transparency, traceability, etc. Big focus is on implementation. Most of the um, uh, pillars are, are driven by the members. We like to have two co-chairs, one retailer, one manufacturer then we are the shepherds of the process, but the, 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 the members have to drive it. You're looking at 50% of the sustainability department. It's just me and one person. So the areas where we operate, I think we have seven billion consumers in one end, going into nine billion soon in 2050. On the other end, we have one and a half billion producers going into two. And in the middle, we have this complexity around uh, retailers, manufacturers, traders, investors, uh, policymakers, processors, etc. Supply chains are now shortening a bit because people want to have more control, especially when it comes to commodities, etc., etc. Traders are not technically members, but we're in dialogue with them. But the most important thing is we have retailers and manufacturers, which is a big chunk of that supply chain. So going into the sustainability pillar, this is what we have. Three board-approved resolutions on deforestation, refrigeration, and food waste. On deforestation, we set up ourselves for zero net deforestation by 2020. And in that pillar, we talk about palm oil, soy, paper and pulp, and beef, because we identified those as the main issues where retailers and manufacturers can have an impact. So there are four working groups led by different retailers and manufacturers. We write sourcing guidelines for each of, of those commodities. We participate in the round tables of sustainable palm oil or, or responsible soy. Same with the Global uh, Beef Initiative. We're very much into the Brazilian um, case for supply, as most of the European and American members supply from there. So that's, that's deforestation. We set up a partnership with the Tropical Forest Alliance and then the Banking Environment Initiative, which is a small initiative out of Cambridge University. 
that looks into uh, things like the sustainable letter of credit uh, and the commodities compact. Food waste, we just uh, approved that resolution June last year. We'll look into half the food waste in our um, members' supply chain by 2025, according to a 2016 baseline. For that, we will use the WRI protocol, the World Resources Institute protocol, on food loss and waste that is being um, approved, I think, next month. So that will that will be the tool that we use. It's the first ever uh, protocol on food waste. And our members will use that to calculate the baseline, and then we'll start every year against the 2025. In addition, we subscribe the SDG 12.3 on food waste, the Sustainable Development Goal. So we're also helping post-harvest and then consumers that happen to be the ones with uh, the most food waste. Because um, it's, it's a mix of things, and I can talk for hours, but uh, from salad bags to yogurts to you name it. It's expiration dates, it's technology, it's refrigeration as well, calibration of refrigerants, of... Uh, cooling facilities, because that makes a huge difference, even at home. You think you have your fridge at 40 degrees, but it's not. It's normally at seven or more, because you open, you close, etc. And this is how we have distributed. There's a long list of, of obviously, working groups, etc., etc. This is where refrigeration is. On the social piece, just, you know, we have the GSCP, Global Social Compliance Program, um, which deals with the harmonization of the different social schemes. If and when you decide to Google that, be very careful, because the first thing that will come up is the Global Swingers Community Program. It is also a social initiative, but different nature. Uh, and we've had requests on... So. Okay, so why did we choose refrigeration? I was talking before about one of the abilities of the Consuming Goods Forum is to identify the issues. All cold, it's still produced by 100-year-old technology, so um, synthetic fluids that absorb and release heat plus large amounts of electricity. So we go back to the energy efficiency. So the US um, uses as much electricity as the whole Africa for everything. And the cooling systems already account for about 40% of the power used in Mumbai. Half of Saudi Arabia's peak summer power consumption and 20% of the total electricity in, in, in the UK. Refrigeration is significant and a growing source of greenhouse gases. I, I think Tim's presentation addressed it very well. So uh, you have the Velders quote in there. For some reason, cold is the Cinderella of the energy debate in many geographies. So if we don't change the way we do this thing, these things, uh, the consequences will be dramatic, as it was mentioned this morning. And, and a very important topic that I would like to stress as well, an HFC phase down could prevent warming up to 0.1 degrees, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it is, by 2050, and half a degree by 2100. So if we do nothing, that's what we're set for. And we have the most cost-effective climate mitigation strategy in front of us, and it's available now. So this is one of the arguments we, we, we use with um, retailers and manufacturers. There's no real excuse not to do it now. Overview of the refrigerants, you know uh, it well. Montreal Protocol, those two are out, uh, even though we've still seen HCFCs in, in Indonesia, for example, a couple of weeks ago. It's not banned probably until 2030, which gives them excuse to use it until 2029 and then switch to HFCs. That's precisely what we need to avoid, and that's what we need to get the industry together to, to make sure that those things don't happen. The rest, obviously, uh, ammonia, CO2, and hydrocarbons are more energy efficient and effectively no GWP. That's the resolution we developed in 2010 that was effective until December uh, last year. To begin phasing out HFC refrigerants in new installations as of 2015. It might not be the most aggressive in the world, but what we did is to get the industry together. To make sure that the board signs off on that, it's blood, sweat, and tears. A lot of meetings, words in and out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we got that, and we accomplished a lot in the past five years. We 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 accomplished what you have in your booklets that I will talk in a minute. It's pilots, it's test, it's people going into 
getting comfortable with natural refrigerants against what they were advised by, uh, by the industry in many geographies. So the scope is the one you have in there, obviously, manufacturers, retailers, cold stores, and industrial facilities. The approach, precisely development of scale, which is what we need. Actively shape public policy. We're not a lobbying organization. That said, soft advocacy doesn't hurt, which means letters and gatherings and getting the industry together, making sure we advise the industry as well in different geographies. And to collect uh, best practices with the booklet that uh, you have in your, in your desk. Some of the um, activities that we did, obviously the working group is, uh, is, is very active, is led by SAB Miller today. And uh, then John Skelton from Sainsbury's. He used to be Emma Coles from uh, Ahold. And we recently um, uh, had a change in there. In terms of best practice sharing, we organized three refrigeration summits. Again, it's important to get people together, talk about these things, get the technical piece, the policy piece, uh, make sure that people are comfortable. Two um, seminars in Chicago, and or two in the US, Chicago and Atlanta, one in London, a best practice document, an activation toolkit, a number of webinars in 2015 uh, to promote this, um, this initiative with the members. Even though we have 400 members, that doesn't mean the 400 are engaged uh, uh, or that the 400 have refrigeration installations, but we need to um, move the needle in the right direction and some members are disengaged. Unfortunately, for example, in the case of Australia, we have only a few members. I would like to see more members. We, as I said, cannot be everywhere, but, but it's very important what team does through IRA. The fact that we connected with them, the fact that we can get the industry together in here, I think it's it's the only way to really move the needle. Um, the refrigeration booklet that you have in there, it basically, it walks the talk. It basically says, yes, we can. People have done it successfully and it works and it's feasible. So don't be scared if you happen to uh, be thinking about it, it's just do it. Uh, through the webinars, some of the members have shared this, these examples, so it's not really... We obviously have an anti-competitive and an, an anti-trust uh, caution that we read in every meeting, but members are very open to share this uh, with others, uh, as long as it doesn't have any secret information, which typically doesn't. In terms of progress, um, and you'll have a lot in the book, but uh, you know, in the case of Europe, for example, when it comes to uh, retailers, those are some of the members. Uh, Heineken, for example, had a smart dispense system that reduced, reduced the pub's average uh, energy use for cooling installations by 90%. Albert uh, Hagen, which is Ahold, uh, stores are already running on hybrid CO2 systems and almost 50 stores are fully into uh, CO2. So it's clear that using CO2 refrigerants uh, reaps both environmental and financial benefits. It is more energy efficient, so less electricity is required. It generates savings of up to uh, 10, 20 percent for them. Uh, systems are more air, um, airtight and less gas is released. And there are guarantees in terms of safety, as you know, uh, is non-flammable, non-corrosive, chemically inert, non-toxic and non-hazardous for uh, people in the store. In 1995, ICA, the um, Swedish retailer, um, built the first store in Sweden with 100% natural refrigerants, 1995, with ammonia and CO2. In 2010, it was verified that the technology has reached a level that matched the best HFC technology. Uh, and since then, ICA has adopted technology as, as a standard, the ammonia and CO2. So the pro I think they're 100% natural now. M&S, Mark and Spencer, uh, is, uh, is now ongoing a trial to replace HFCs with nitrogen in 14 food delivery trailers. And stores will be HFC free by uh, 2030. And you have all those examples in, in there. When we go to the US, we have about 300 stores. Um, different legislation in the US, different ambition, I would say. Sobeys, for example, in Canada, 
uh, comparing to traditional HFC systems, the use of natural refrigerants enabled them uh, to reduce 62% their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the installation cost reduction was up to 15%, or reduced by 15%. The energy usage, uh, again, minus 15%. Heating gas savings, up to 20%. Campbell Soups, another uh, giant in the U.S., uh, replaced HFCs with ammonia in three out of the nine factories with an expectation to complete everything by 2018. Uh, their CEO happens to be now the co-chair of the entire CGF. Uh, it's Campbell's and Pick and Pay uh, in South Africa. When it comes to, uh, to Asia, in 2011, Tesco in China used natural refrigeration system, CO2, opened a second store with CO2 refrigeration in Beijing, I think it was early this year. In uh, 2009, Aeon became the first Japanese retailer to introduce natural refrigeration, um, CO2 freezers and refrigerators. As of the end of uh, 2015, uh, they have introduced natural refrigerants, um, CO2-based equipment in 45 new stores. Uh, they faced quite a lot of challenges in this, um, including the lack of supplier choice, which is typically what happens in <coughs> other geographies, uh, specific regulation on natural refrigerants, and trying to overcome issues by creating awareness with um, stakeholders. Situation in, in uh, Australia, uh, Tim um, went through that. So far, uh, Woolworths has been um, uh, our most a active member um, here in Australia with natural uh, refrigerants. In the case of Africa, we have uh, Peak and Pay, Walmart, and another Woolworths. Um, and they, um, they also face difficulties from the legislation point of view. Our summit will be in Cape Town this year, so we're trying to uh, have a session on refrigerants and attract uh, some of the African players as well is the market needs a lot of development. We only have 20 stores in there. When it comes to manufacturers, we calculate about 4 million units across the uh, globe for CGF members. They normally have small scale fridges, uh, similar regional picture to retailers, and, and then shifting from HFC could be expensive for them. But uh, if you shift at scale, uh, the cost immediately come down. So that's precisely what we need. It's scale. And if you talk to Coca-Cola or PepsiCo or Heineken or SAP Miller, uh, they're almost 100% into natural refrigerants. And, and it was a scale what gave them the, the greatest opportunity. A few of the, uh, the myths that you will find, natural refrigerants, not viable in hot countries. Carrefour went through it in the uh, store in Valencia, where it's hot and humid with a transcritical CO2 refrigeration system. Uh, Tesco did it in uh, Thailand with that um, hydrocarbon refrigeration system. We have examples in uh, developing countries where a lot of people think this doesn't work. Tesco did it in Thailand, Pick and Pay and Walmart in South Africa. Walmart did it extensively in, in Mexico where they have a large number of um, stores. Carrefour did it in, in Turkey. And uh, when it comes to, uh, well, developing countries for manufacturers, the same thing, Coke Pe and Pepsi, um, about 280,000 units in Eurasia and 28,000 in, 28, in the Americas. Good example on cost, for example, you have again Carrefour and, and uh, Sobeys. You can read through the example, but uh, costs were found to be lower than HFC. 90% less expensive than traditional refrigerants. And then you have the example of, of Sobeys in um, Canada, where operating cost and energy savings will offset the initial capital cost. And those examples are available in the UNEP webpage. The next steps, what do we do? A resolution was, uh, was closed in 2015. That doesn't mean we stop working, obviously, but we need to continue uh, monitoring public policy and the regulatory environment. EU policy, the FGAS, going well. We're happy in Europe with those developments. We're bringing the, the, the members behind the regulation, cutting-edge technology, 
no real problem. We're more concerned on developing areas, on, on the Americas, for example, uh, Canada and the US. We, uh, we have a good ongoing dialogue with UNEP's uh, CCAC um, and the private sector efforts of uh, the other two organizations would probably uh, join in um, CCAC as actors at some point. Then engagement with key stakeholders, uh, such as trade associations, civil society. We have ongoing conversations with, uh, obviously, Sheco and nat refrigerants naturally, NGOs like Greenpeace, EIA, uh, and what is most important, uh, associations like uh, IRA that can open an entire market for the CGF and bring the industry together, which is what we need. The new commitment, potential new commitment or resolution, uh, might have a target. We're discussing this at the moment. Um, I'm particularly interested in including leaks management, a commitment on responsible disposal, which I think is, is critical, and, and the whole issue around doors in, uh, in refrigerators with the energy and cost savings that it includes. I think that's important for the industry. It's, it's important to capture it in a commitment. I don't know how far we'll, we'll go. We're now discussing it at our working group, different views from different people. Um, obviously, um, different regions with different legislation have different ambitions as well. So that's those are the plans that we have. Happy to discuss with you uh, later on. How can you get involved? Obviously, for those of you retailers, manufacturers, happy to welcome you as a member. But in any case, start piloting solutions by all means. Measure your existing footprint and the life of your products. Share best practices as much as you can in the geographies where you operate. Contribute to the uh, efforts such as IRA in Australia. Uh, join our webinars if you happen to be a member. Or meet us at the Refrigeration Summit that we're hoping to organize this year. Uh, it looks like Brazil but we're still not sure. It'll be fourth quarter, um, fourth quarter in uh, 2016. So let me just finish. Going back to the initial um, thought. I think overall using the benefits of an activity while ignoring its impact on the environment, it's not an option today. We need to be very, very careful about what we do um, and I think that shows that there's no longer an excuse not to go into natural refrigerants and keep this ongoing uh, situation. I think as citizen and, and industrialists, politicians, practitioners, you name it, we need to understand the environmental challenges that we face and the world we're going to live in. And, and that shows precisely the situation. So it is now, not later. And it can do it now, and as I said to some of the uh, more reluctant members, keep calm and just F do it now. Because <laughs> 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 otherwise, uh, we're going to be in this game forever. Thank you very much to all of you.